to the wise men were led by love to find Jesus, the one who is love, incarnate. And we know about their visit. They were led by love to find Jesus, the one who is love incarnate. And we know about that, about their visit. Because when we allow it to, and they did, love always writes a story. Love writes a story when we choose to allow it. Love is born in the Bethlehem of our own heart and writes a story if we allow it with our own lives. And mostly the stories are not big grand things with fireworks and marquees, are they? Mostly the stories that love writes with our own lives are small and powerful, like a baby. Do you know how powerful a baby is? Somebody carries a baby into this room right this second. Y'all forget about the preacher, don't you? Like all us. Mostly the stories that love writes with our lives are small, little things and powerful like a baby. Here's one. Here's a story that, that love wrote buried in our own text. The wise men brought gifts that are really not appropriate for an infant. When was the last time someone said, get the baby some myrrh? But Mary and Joseph didn't say anything about that, about the fact that their guest had brought inappropriate gifts for a baby. Well, you see, because even in their world, even in their day, the world was full of complaints, and they saw no reason to add their own to the mix. So they just said, thank you, and received the gifts. Love wrote that story. It's small, but it's powerful like a baby. Here's another story Love wrote. King Herod asked the wise men to let him know when they found the baby Jesus. You know why? Because he was scared. Because he was afraid of losing his power to another one called King. And one of the wise men woke up in the middle of the night with an intuition, a whispering thought. Has that ever happened to you? One of them woke up with this intuition which said in a whisper, let's not get tangled up with that man, King Herod. And you know, they didn't make a big deal of it, you know. They just went home by another road. The world in their day was full enough of people making big deals out of things. So they just went home by another road. Love wrote that story. It's a small story, but it's powerful like a baby. Powerful enough to last for 2,000 years, right? Love wrote those two stories 2,000 years ago. And love is still writing stories. Here's a story Love wrote recently. Not long ago, I was on a plane, an airplane, to Atlanta. And I was sitting in an aisle seat, and the man across the aisle from me got into an argument with the flight attendant about putting up his laptop computer. The rules say when you take off, you need to put up your laptop computer, but he didn't want to, so he argued with the flight attendant whose job it is to tell us what the rules are. And he got angry, like pretty quickly, he got angry and his anger radiated into the plane like pollution. And I could feel my own insides constrict. Do so, you know what I'm talking about? And I could sense the same tension growing inside of the people around me. And I thought to myself, you know, anger is usually rooted in fear. This man's anger was trying to tell a story about his fear, but it came out all wrong. It came out as an argument. And fear wrote that story. It's powerful. 
Love tells better stories. You do know what I mean? Love tells much better stories. On the return flight, so flying back to Lexington, I sat again on the aisle, and right next to me on the other side, in a middle seat, was a woman whom I know very well and I'm very, very fond of. I won't tell you her name because she might hear this sermon. Most of you know her and I don't want to embarrass her. The truth is, uh, can I give you a, a clue? The truth is I'm very, very in love with her. Have been for a long, long time. So like I say, she was sitting next to me in the middle seat. And next to her, sitting by the window, was a woman, a stranger to us, someone neither of us knew. The woman seemed to me to be about 60 years old. She was short, maybe less than five feet tall. And she had a pronounced, we quickly realized that this woman had a pronounced intellectual disability. She seemed to have the mind of a child. Do you know what I'm talking about? So it was before we even got seated, this woman who was sitting next to the window, who, who seemed to have a pronounced intellectual disability, said in a loud voice, how are you, where are you going, where have you come from? Asked us a thousand questions in this loud, sweet, sweet voice before we even sat down. And the woman I was with, the one I've been in love with for many, many years, whose name I'm not going to say because I don't want to embarrass her, immediately tuned into and engaged with the woman sitting by the window. And she answered every single one of her questions. Does that make sense? And after every detail that the woman that I was with, who I'm very, very in love with, after every detail, the woman sitting next to the window said, oh, that's nice. In the sweetest, most sincere voice, she said over and over again, oh, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. And so for 64 minutes on the flight from Atlanta to Lexington, I had this refrain, this beautiful chorus. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. And the woman who was sitting next to the, to the window there, next to the woman that I've been in love with for many years, was reading, in between questions, a very large children's dictionary. You know, the kind with pictures in it. She would read it very intensely and hold it very close to her face. And she was reading it out loud. And every now and then she would stumble on something. So she would ask the woman that I was with, the one that I'm in love with, to help her. And that woman that I was with is a teacher. Huh? So it came very natural to her to help with the dictionary. And they talked the whole flight about that dictionary and how nice everything is so loudly and so sweetly. And I got a sense that everyone around us was tuned into their conversation. When the plane landed, the woman with the dictionary said very loudly, like to everybody, what can I do about my shoes? And when she said that, the woman I was with, the one I've been in love with for so long, she and I both looked down at our new friend's sock feet. And then looked further down and saw that her shoes were, she'd taken them off. They were tucked under the chair in front of her. And there was the tiniest pause after the question, what can I do with my shoes? There was just the tiniest pause and love whispered something to the woman that I was with. And then the woman that I was with said, well, I'll help you. I'll help you with your shoes. And it struck me later when I thought back on it, what she didn't say. She didn't say after the pause, huh? well, the stewardess will be around to help you, and I work with dictionaries but not shoes, and someone will come along, I'm sure. She said, I'll help you with your shoes. And then, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world to get something out from underneath a plain seat, one seat over and tucked under. But no matter, the woman that I was with leaned over sort of into the lap of the other woman and reached under the chair and picked out the shoes very carefully and one by one helped her new friend put on her shoes. 
And when I say help, I guess I don't mean help because the, the new friend didn't do anything at all. The, the woman I was with put her shoes on her one at a time. Yeah. Love wrote that little story. And you know, when we got off the plane, the man who had been sitting right in front of us, right, there's people all around, the man who was sitting right in front of us was walking, of course, right ahead of us up the ramp into the concourse. And I looked at him, I sort of, sort of spotted him when we got on the plane, and he was a, a well-dressed man, and he, he seemed like, I don't know, maybe a businessman traveling or something, and he, he seemed just absolutely pleasant enough to me, but he also seemed a little guarded. You know, a little turned inward, like he was intentionally sort of minding his own business. You know, like sometimes we do when we're traveling. Just like, yeah, earbuds in and just sort of... But as he was walking ahead of us, he stopped suddenly as we made our way up the ramp. And he turned to the woman that I was with, the one I've been in love for so many years. And he mumbled something that neither of us could understand. It was like... It was kind of weird, to be honest. It was like a different, like, secret language. It just it, We couldn't understand what he was saying. And he, he sort of bailed on what he was trying to say, and he turned around and just kept walking. And he walked for a couple of more steps, and then he stopped and he turned back around. And this time he really stopped, squared up to the woman that I was with, the one that I've been in love with for so many years. And he looked her dead in the eye. And he got it out. But it was kind of stumbling. And I thought, to be honest, I thought he was going to cry. I thought something was wrong with him. He said this, ma'am, um, you are very kind. Thank you. And then he turned around. And he walked away. And, and that's a little bitty story. Like one you might not notice, you know? But isn't it powerful? Isn't it small and powerful like a baby? You know, Love wrote a little story, this little silly little story about these two women and a, and a pair of shoes and a children's dictionary. And the man sitting in front of them heard the story and it became his story. Like Love wrote that story into his story. And he let down his guard to try to tell the woman that her kindness had affected him and he couldn't do it, right? Like he had a go at it and he, he just couldn't get it out. But then he made a choice, right? He made a choice to have another go at it. And the second time he had a go at it, he got it out. Ma'am, you are very kind. Thank you. And love wrote that story. And now I've told you that story. Hmm? And so in a sort of way, it's your story now, isn't it? And you know, I have to believe that the story that love wrote is stuck inside that man's heart. Like stuck in there. Like, like love wrote that little story and then put it in his heart and stuck it to the walls of his heart. And I have to believe that that man, that's now his story. And I have to believe that that story is now his and it's changing him in some way right this second. He's got this funny little story about these two funny little women on this funny little plane and a funny little pair of shoes. And I got to thinking, you know, that's what our work is. No, I got to thinking about this. Our work as Christians in this world is to let love, like make a choice, let love write stories through us. And they don't have to be big, big grand stories with fireweek works and, and our names on the marquees. No, mostly the stories we can let love right through us are simple. Simple stories about the love of Jesus filtering through our very bodies. Like water trickling gently through rocks in a stream bed. And we've got a choice, you know? Oh, we can get tangled up in fear and anger and complaint and discontent and tell the world that story. Or we can go home by another road. No, we can go home by another road. We can let love write a story through our own lives today. And we can build on that. And let our whole lives... Can you imagine this? Let our whole lives become a story that love wrote. What about that? 
What if my life and your life, our lives, become a story that love wrote? Wouldn't that just be the thing? Simple, powerful, like a baby. Amen.